Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. All right, welcome back to Bible Rama. Who's excited to be at Bible Rama? Oh, the B I B L E. Yes, that's the book for me. I read and study and then obey the B I B L E. Oh, the B I B L E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B I B L E. I'm going on a journey on the Happy Day Express. The letters on the engine spelled. He was having fun with it. Boo. Let's try that again. All right, everybody say J E S U S. Everybody say heaven. Everybody say choo choo. I'm going on a journey on the Happy Day Express. The letters on the engine spell. When the conductor calls out, I'll surely answer. I'm going on a journey on the Happy Day Express. I'm going on journey on the happy day express the letters on the engine spelled j-e-s-u-s when the conductor calls out heaven i'll surely answer yes! i'm going on a journey on the happy day express yes! booster booster be a booster don't be grouchy like a rooster booster booster be a booster and boost our Bible school. Good job. One more time. Booster, booster, be a booster. Don't be grouchy like a rooster. Booster, booster, be a booster. And boost our Bible school. Good job. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine all the time, let it shine. I'm all wrapped up, I'm all tied up, I'm all hang it up in Jesus. I'm all wrapped up, I'm all tied up, I'm all hang it up in God. I'm all wrapped up, I'm all tied up, I'm all hang it up in Jesus. I'm all wrapped up, tied up, hang it up in God. Oh yeah, all around the neighborhood, I'm gonna let it shine. All around the neighborhood, I'm gonna let it shine. All around the neighborhood, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine all the time, let it shine. I'm all wrapped up, I'm all tied up, I'm all tang it up in Jesus, I'm all wrapped up, I'm all tied up, I'm all tang it up in God, I'm all wrapped up, I'm all tied up, I'm all tang it up in Jesus, I'm all wrapped up, tied up, tang it up in God. Oh yeah, hide it under a bushel. No, I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine all the time, let it shine. I'm all wrapped up, I'm all tied up, I'm all tangled up in Jesus, I'm all wrapped up, I'm all tied up, I'm all tangled up in God, I'm all wrapped up, I'm all tied up, I'm all tangled up in Jesus, wrapped up, tied up, tangled up in God, oh yeah. Won't let Satan it out, I'm gonna let it shine. Won't let Satan it out, I'm gonna let it shine. Won't let Satan it out. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine all the time, let it shine. I'm all wrapped up, I'm all tied up, I'm all tangled up in Jesus. I'm all wrapped up, I'm all tied up, I'm all tangled up in God. I'm all wrapped up, I'm all tied up, I'm all tangled up in Jesus. Wrapped up, tied up, tangled up in God, oh yeah. Read your Bible, pray every day and grow, grow, grow. Read your Bible, pray every day and grow, grow, grow. Grow, 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 grow. 
read your Bible, pray every day and grow, grow, grow. Neglect your Bible, never pray and shrink, shrink, shrink. Neglect your Bible, never pray and shrink, shrink, shrink. Shrink, 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 shrink. Neglect your Bible, never pray and shrink, shrink, shrink. But read your Bible, pray every day and grow, grow, grow. Read your Bible, pray every day and grow, grow, grow. Grow, 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 grow. Read your Bible, pray every day and grow, grow, grow. I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never fly or the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. I may never march in the infantry, Ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never fly or the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. All right. Everybody get on your donkey. I may never travel to New Mexico, ride a donkey do -si do wear a big sombrero. I may never eat a bean burrito, but I'm in the Lord's army. Si, senor. I'm in the Lord's army. Si, senor. I'm in the Lord's army. Si, senor. I may never travel to New Mexico, ride a donkey do -si do wear a big sombrero. I may never eat a bean burrito, but I'm in the Lord's army. Si, senor. Who's the king of the jungle? Who's the king of the sea? Water, water, water. Who's the king of the universe? And who's the king of me? His name is J-E-S-U-S. Yes, he's the king of me. He's the king of the universe, the jungle and the sea. Water, water, water. Who's the king of the jungle? Who's the king of the jungle? Better. Who's the king of the sea? Water. Who's the king of the sea? Water. Who's the king of the universe? And who's the king of me? Yeah. That was great. You want to come up here? You want to? I need somebody to come help. You want to come? You can bring a friend. Or you just keep doing what you're doing right there because you're doing awesome. We're going to sing it again. Everybody over here wants to be just like you. Who's the king of the jungle? Who's the king of the jungle? Who's the king of the sea? Who's the king of the universe? And who's the king of me? His name is... Yes, he's the king of me. He's the king of the universe, the jungle and the sea. Water, water, water. Who's the king of the jungle? Who's the king of the sea? Who's the king of the universe? And who's the king of me? Jesus. Hey, hey. Hi, my name is Noah. I got a wife, three kids, and I work in a boat factory. One day, God said, hey, Noah, are you busy? I said, no. He said, good. Then build me a boat with your right arm. Hi, my name is Noah. I got a wife, three kids, and I work in a boat factory. One day, God said, hey, Noah, are you busy? I said, no. He said, good. Then build me a boat with your left arm. Hi, my name is Noah. I got a wife, three kids, and I work in a boat factory. One day, God said, hey, Noah, are you busy? I said, no. He said, good. Then build me a boat with your right leg. Hi, my name is Noah. I got a wife, three kids, and I work in a boat factory. One day, God said, hey, Noah, are you busy? I said, no. He said, good. Then build me a boat with your left leg. Hi, my name is Noah. I got a wife, three kids, and I work in a boat factory. One day, God said, hey, Noah, are you busy? I said, no. 
He said, good. Then build me a boat with your head. Hi, my name is Noah. I got a wife, three kids, and I work in a boat factory. One day, God said, hey, Noah, are you busy? I said, no. He said, good. Then build me a boat with your tongue. Hi, my name is Noah. I got a wife, three kids, and I work in a boat factory. One day, God said, hey, Noah, are you busy? I said, yes. You can sit down. There was a rich old king, he had a thousand men, he marched them up the hill, up the hill, and then he marched them down again. Now when you're up, you're up, and when you're down, you're down, but when you're only halfway up, you're neither up or down. All right, that's as easy as it gets. There was a rich old king, he had a thousand men, he marched them up the hill and then out. He marched them down again. Now when you're up, you're up, and when you're down, you're down. But when you're only halfway up, you're neither up. Everybody right there, out or down. There was a rich old king, he had a thousand men, he marched them up the hill and then he marched them down again. Now when you're up, you're up, and when you're down, you're down, when you're only halfway, if you're neither up or down. One more time. There was a rich old king, he had a thousand men, he marched them up the hill, and then he marched them down again. Now when you're up, you're up, and when you're down, you're down, but when you're only halfway up, you're neither up or down. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. He answers prayers. He answers prayers. He answers prayers. He's so good to me. Who can come tell me the memory verse? Do you know it? Well, come here. We're going to put you on the spot. Come stand right up here. What's the verse? James chapter 4, verse 7. You don't know it. Who knows it? Well, come here, Holder. Stand right there. Come on up here. What's the verse? Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil, and the devil will free f flee from you. Come close. come close to God, and God will come close to you. <laughs> Wash your hands. Purify your heart. You double-minded. Double What's the verse again? James? James, uh... Eight, four, eight, four, seven, eight. Good job. Right. Will Lloyd, you come say the prayer. God is listening, God is listening when we pray, when we pray. Bow our heads just slightly, close our eyes so tightly. Now let's pray, now let's pray. God is listening, God is listening when we pray, when we pray. Bow our heads just slightly, close our eyes so tightly. Now let's pray, now let's pray. Dear Lord, thanks for my blessing, thank for us every day. Um, doing what we want and be with all the people in the nursing home or sick or even hurting and be with them and thank you for a wonderful day you bless us and thank you for the fed food they eat most of all like your son that cross our sins in Jesus name amen good job if everybody will be quiet 
Now we'll have our drama. All right, boys and girls, we're ready to start. <clears throat> Tonight's drama is John Prepares for Jesus. Make way for the Lord. Change your hearts and lives. The kingdom of heaven is coming soon. Make way for the Lord. Change your hearts and lives. The kingdom of heaven is coming soon. Make way for the Lord. To prepare the Jews for the promised Savior, Jesus' cousin John who was six months older than Jesus, began preaching to the people that the Savior and the kingdom of heaven were coming soon. John had a strange appearance. He lived in the wilderness where he ate wild honey and locusts, and he dressed in animal hair and leather. Huge crowds came to the banks of the Jordan River to hear him preach. John's message was not easy to hear. He accused the people of being sinful. They needed to change their lives before accepting Jesus and his teachings. Among the crowd were the leaders of the Jews, Pharisees and Sadducees, who were proud and greedy. You poisonous snakes, who told you to run away from God's anger that is coming? You should do the things that show you have really changed your hearts and lives. Do not say Abraham is my father, for God can make children from the rocks that we stand on for Abraham. Beware, God's anger is ready to cut you down like an axe. And for every tree that does not produce good fruit, you will be thrown into the fire. Tell us, what must we do? You must do the things that show you have changed your hearts and lives. If you have two shirts, share one of them with someone that doesn't have one. But if you have food, share that also. Tax collector, no one likes me. What should I do? Do not take any more money that is, than, that is instructed by your government. Well, the soldiers enforce the law. What should we do? Do not force people to give you money. Do not lie and threaten them. Only t be happy with the pay that you're given. This prophet must be the Christ. He's the one we waiting for. This is my example. No, I am not the Christ. I am, I am only one spoken of by the prophets when they wrote. I will send my messenger ahead, ahead and he will prepare the way. There is, there is a coming, there is one coming who is greater than I am. And I am not even worthy enough to untie his sandals. Listen, I, I baptize you with water, but there is one that is, that is coming that can do so much more. And he can baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Many of those who listen to John's preaching were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Great crowds continued to gather to hear John preach and be baptized by him. At that time, Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan River and wanted John to baptize him. But John tried to stop him. But why do you come here to be baptized? I should be baptized by you. John, it has to be this way. We have to do all things that are right in our Father's eyes. So John agreed to baptize Jesus. As Jesus came up out of the water, heaven opened, and Jesus saw God's Spirit 
coming down on him like a dove. And the voice of God spoke from heaven. This is my son, and I love him. I am very pleased with him. Jesus left the Jordan River. From there, he went into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Using the sword of the Spirit, God's word, he defeated the devil and began his work on earth. There's got to be a freaking warm light here somewhere. Hopefully, I turn my mic off. Boys and girls. Last night, we counted up who came, who brought a Bible, who brought a friend. Tonight, adding them up again, I need Lucy Dye to stand up. Where's Lucy? I don't know that I could see her standing up. Where's Lucy? There she is. You are standing. Lucy's got six points with seven points. Where's Jax Howell? There he is. And Knox Hurston, a tie with seven. There's Knox with eight points. I've got Caroline Dye. Where's Caroline? There she is. And with 17 points, you? Where is Levi Smith? Good job. Come here, Levi. See all these handsome guys up here? If you were going to pick one of those on Wednesday night to either get a bucket of slime or a bucket of water or dunked in a dunking booth, who do you think you would pick? Who? Jeff. Yeah. All right, you can go sit down. Man, early. What'd you get? What? 3.30. We got 330 people here tonight. That was great. I think we had 3.28 last night, having good numbers. If you were here last night, you did awesome through the storm. It was great. Uh, we made it very well. I'm so glad that you came back tonight. We've got good speakers. We've got good food. And we're going to have a whole lot of fun. So let's sing a few more songs, and then we'll go to class. Let's... I need some volunteers. Come on up. I need... Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. You can come up here. Come on, Lincoln. Come stand up here. Y'all stand on this step right here. Come down on the step. Yeah. All right, I'll spread out, spread out, spread out, spread out. Put the boys in here. Yeah. Come here, Lincoln. Come up here, up here on the step. All right. We're going to sing the smile song, and we're going to use a whole lot of smiles, but you can't smile right now. Wipe it off. We'll, you'll get there. Can you smile? Don't do it. Don't. Don't hold it. I don't want you to smile yet. Just hold it right there. Don't. We're going to have to kick you out of here first. All right. Ready? You can smile when you can't say a word. I need everybody else out here to sing. You can smile when you can't say a word. You can smile when you cannot be heard. You can smile when it's cloudy or fair. You can smile anytime, anywhere. We're going to sing the song again. But we're going to point to one of them, and you give me the best smile that you can give me. Not yet! Not yet! <laughs> Hold it in until it's time. Ready? You can.
and you can't say a word, you can, you're out, get out, yeah, go. When you cannot be heard, you can, when, it, better, better, you can stay. When it's cloudy or fair, you can, anytime, anywhere, you can. When you can't say a word, you can. When you cannot be heard, you can. When it's cloudy or fair, you can. Anytime, anywhere, you can. When you can't say a word, you can. When you cannot be heard, you can. There we go. When it's cloudy or fair, now everybody, you can. Anytime, anywhere. Good job. Y'all go sit down. Y'all were great. Whoop. Blue skies and rainbows and sunbeams from heaven are what I can see. When my Lord is living in me, I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Nevermore will I be all alone since he promised me that we never would part tall mountains green valleys the beauty that surrounds me all makes me aware of the one who made it all i know that jesus is well and alive today he makes his home in my heart never Promise me that we never would part. Y'all ready to go to class? Yeah. All right. I'm going to dismiss everybody by their behavior. The teen class, y'all have been great back there. Y'all are going upstairs in the building next door, but if you would not mind, if y'all will go out the front and around, it makes it easier for the little kids. So if y'all will go that way, and go upstairs. I need the five-year-old. All right, let's do this. Cradle roll, twos, threes, and fours. Y'all can go to class. Two-year-olds, if y'all will go to the right. Three and four-year-olds, if y'all will go to the left, but you're going to the uh, communion ring back there. Fifth and sixth grade, if y'all will stand up. Y'all are going outside, but y'all care to go out this door and walk that way? What good are y'all? First and second. First and second, y'all are going to the craft room. Y'all can go to the right. Got him. Thank you. Thank you. Where's your sister? Oh, go. Go with her. You see her? There she is. Let's go, boys. Oh, there's a lot of talking going on up here. A lot of standing, a lot of talking. Where are you going, Bo? Riggins Johnston, sit down. Third and fourth grade, young stand up. Man, that's a big class. Where's your teacher? Come on up to the front. There she is. Y'all are going to the lesson. Y'all are not going to the lesson room. Who did I send out to the lesson room? 
fifth and sixth. So y'all go to the game room. Y'all go that way and go to the game room. Hey, I sent the wrong class. It's all right. Yeah. Just tell Eddie that we're out. We're out of order. He's had to change. Y'all are going to the snack room. You can go now. You need to be in the front. Three hundred and thirty. Where's JD? You got a PowerPoint? Nope. nope. I'll see you back there now, and I'll scoot you on up. Three hundred and thirty is our tentative number right now. Not counting anybody that might have been outside when we counted. Um, so if you were here last night, let me update you. We have a. I mentioned it last night. If you were here, we did have a tornado warning. During uh, Vacation Bible School last night, we made every precaution to keep the kids safe. We even halted VBS activities and made sure that they were in a safe place. Um, there is a video and pictures that I would love to show you maybe Wednesday night of the, um, all the five-year-old through sixth grade sitting Indian style, shoulder to shoulder, all in the kitchen next door and us singing... Wise man built his house on the rock, and I was supposed to come over here and dismiss this class and make sure we dismissed on time, but I got stuck over there, and we made it work. But um, the teenagers came downstairs and occupied this hallway until we realized that, well, the second or the two-year-olds and the three-year-olds have to change classes, so the teenagers occupied this hallway. Dustin Perkins didn't let that stop. He preached from the hallway, and they sang over here, and you probably never even heard them, but they were wonderful. And um, like I said, we got in the kitchen over here. The two-year-olds and three-year-olds were safe right here behind the baptistry, and everywhere was everybody was where they needed to be. The uh, Our security team, if you see them walking around with a little piece in their ear, they do a wonderful job. They were on top of it. They were watching the weather from back here. They knew it was coming before it even looked like it was coming from outside. Our little tent that was in the back is demolished. It is gone. The uh, big tent out here over there is still standing. But uh, So we're back on our normal schedule, lesson room outside. The two, three, and four-year-olds will play outside on the blow-ups, and the, uh, we'll rotate around. But yesterday, it really couldn't have gone much smoother. The, the team was watching it. They made sure that we were safe. I think one class missed doing a craft, so I apologize that they get to do, get, didn't get to take home a craft that you're probably going to throw away in a few days anyways, but um, they missed that. But the ones that missed eating, we made sure that they ate. So I appreciate you and your patience. I know it might have been a little rough if you were in here wondering what was going on with your kids, but uh, it, it went wonderful, and everybody did what they were supposed to do, and the, the team was in place. Um, Troy, there you are. Troy's going to lead a song. Gary, Sean. Sean in here? I'm going to get Joey. Will you lead us in a prayer as soon as the song's over? Troy's going to come lead us in a song. Joey's going to lead us in a prayer. And then I'll introduce our speaker. I'll tell you what, in the middle of this, let me put this. Several, several years ago, I was doing that at Summertown, and uh, many, many moons ago when I was young. <laughs> and I asked for volunteer or uh, uh, request. And my youngest daughter, Rachel, raised her hand, and I said, okay, Rachel, what do you want to sing? And she said, why would you come in here looking like that? 
Dolly Parton, a Dolly Parton song. <laughs> so I thought of that when Sean, uh, Jared was leading those songs. So you don't want to ask for requests. <laughs> um, 798. If he puts that up there, if not the songbook, I think there it is. I try to match these songs up with the topic each night. Sometimes it's hard to get a good one to go with this, especially tomorrow night. I, years ago, we had one that's Get Behind Me, Satan. I know it's not in any of his songbooks, but this guy had uh, written it. It was an engineer at Lexington Studio, and we were singing, recording a, a record down there, and he asked us if we would record that, so we were the first ones to get to record that. It's a good song, but you won't find it in a book. 798. Yield not to temptation or yielding is sin. Each victory will help you some other to win. Fight manfully onward, dark passions subdue. Look ever to Jesus, he will carry you through. Ask the Savior to help you, comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you. He will carry you through. Shun evil companions, bad language disdain. God's name hold in reverence, nor take it in vain. Be thoughtful and earnest, kind-hearted and true. Look ever to Jesus, he will carry you through. Ask the Savior to help you, comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you. He will carry you through to him that overcometh. God giveth a crown. Through faith we shall conquer, though often cast down. He who is our Savior, our strength will renew. Look ever to Jesus, he will carry you through. Ask the Savior to help you, comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you, he will carry you through. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for letting us be here this night, and we thank you for this crowd that we have. And Father, we thank you for the Bible Rama that we have also, and thank you for the young children and uh, the young adults that are here and taking their time just to learn more about your word. And Father, we ask that you help them live that from day to day. Father, you know it's a tough world out there, and we hope as adults that we can be the examples that we need to be. And Father, again, we just thank you for our church family here at Etheridge, and we also thank you for the visitors, and we certainly ask that you be with them in their travels and keep them safe. Father, we thank you for everyone who's participated, everyone who has helped, and just the prayers for the Bible Rama here this week. Father, uh, we thank you for the speaker that's here tonight, and uh, let us get something from his lesson and use it in our day-to-day -day lives. And again, we thank you for everything, all of the blessings, and for, but most of all, we thank you for your compassion and your love for us. It's through your Son, my Savior, Jesus Christ, that I ask this prayer. Amen. So every year we do Vacation Bible School, what we call Bible Rama, here for the kids. I mean, it is... It is, it is all lined up to benefit the kids. We separate out the adult, or the, the adult, the, the dramas are specifically geared towards the kids. So that when they go outside, we can talk about what they saw, 
as well as you know go through the lesson because we do start off with ages that we can't read and they they can't pay attention long enough if we read it to them so the dramas are an amazing part of what we do here at Etheridge it's part of our history I remember watching the dramas and Tessie and Jesse puppets when I was little and so I'm thankful that we still have the ability to do that um, even though a lot of churches and places around us don't and I don't necessarily think it it's unique to us it is a amazing teaching tool and every year I try to make sure that I watch them practice and I tell the actors what you do matters because it brings it to life for the kids so that we can talk about it and relate it to daily life now what's great about this class and for everybody that comes and I'm so thankful that you're here uh, I'm thankful especially if you brought a child or a grandchild or if you didn't if you're just here to listen tonight because we're able to go from milk to meat and we've seen the lesson. We've got a scripture that goes along with it. Um, but I'm thankful for our speaker tonight because our speakers are able to come through. And, hey, let's bring out James chapter 4, 7 and 8. We've broken it down, a 7A, a 7B, an 8A, and an 8B for our four nights. Our speaker tonight is John David Swartz. And um, when I was a youth minister before we moved back to Tennessee, I had... There was two guys. You know, you've seen that on a commercial or somewhere or on, on Facebook that if I gave you a million dollars and you, you got one phone call and that person had to answer, well, there was, there was two guys that I could do that with. And uh, one's name was Barry Throneberry and the other one was J.D. Swartz. If I needed them, they were there. If I said, hey, I need to talk to you, it was what time? And... Uh, they have always been an amazing part of my life. I've always been able to talk to them about things and bounce things off of them, look to them for guidance and, and be mentors for me. Um, I, I got a ton of stories I could tell you about J.D. One of them involves him face down in the middle of a highway in Indiana. Was it Indiana? Yeah. That was, that was a, that's a good one. And that, uh, <laughs> that was a good one. Holler at me. You were on the bus? We'll save that for another time. I won't say anything bad about him. John David is the youth minister at Graymere. He, um, he's been doing youth ministry for 21 years. I asked J.D. to come up here and, yes, talk to you about the verse. But at the end, I told him, like, hey, I want you to take a teenage perspective on this. You're a youth minister, so I want you to talk about submitting to God in a family role and how we can submit to God as well as and resist the devil as well as help train our children and our grandchildren to resist the devil as well and so JD is going to take on that perspective I won't take up any more of his time um, his wife Amy is she at CA his wife Amy is a school teacher teaching at Columbia Academy um, she is a big part of his ministry, especially his, uh, the girls' ministry there at Graymere. Um, J.D. is involved with the chapel at Columbia Academy and gets to go in there and open up the scripture and teach those kids, and, as well as his work at Graymere. But he does such a wonderful job. I know he's going to be a great speaker today. Uh, the last I got was right now we're at like 3.30. We'll get an official count, and I'll have it to you here in just a minute. But that was great. Any I'd love to see us over 300 every night. I hope everyone enjoys it and you'll come back for the next two nights because we've got two more wonderful speakers the next two nights and really good dramas and, and a lot of fun for the kids. All right. Good evening, everybody. Um, man, 21 years of youth ministry. When I started, I started at, at Pulaski Street in Lawrenceburg. And uh, my relationship with this church was super important to me. So... I look out over this crowd and I see a lot of faces I recognize. I may not know all of your names uh, anymore, um, but this church has always been special to me. Uh, tonight, uh, we're going to start off in John chapter 8. Uh, our topic for tonight is resist the devil. And I feel like I was thinking about Sam Hickman today and because I was hoping I'd get to see him to hear, but I also felt like, like I'm stepping back 20 years and having to do a lesson, resist the devil, just for Sam Hickman. And all the trouble that I know he got in growing up. Um, that's not for real. I love Sam. Uh, and we go back a long ways. Uh, Sam resists the devil, okay? All right? Uh, man, we've got a lot of stories among, you know, me and Jared and Sam and 
Uh, Miss Janie was on that trip. I forgot about that. Um, anyways, uh, we're going to be in John chapter 8 for a moment. And uh, we're going to start in verse 41. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. And he says, you are doing the deeds of your father. And they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. And Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and have come from God. For I have not even come on my own initiative, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I am saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. And you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I speak the truth... You do not believe me. For me, this is an easy one at the moment. When we're talking about a group of people and we look at the Pharisees and we say, well, yeah, um, you know, they're sitting there railing on Jesus. They're making fun of him. They know uh, that he came from a virgin birth. But in their minds, what that meant was that he was born of fornication. And so that's that line. You were born of fornication. We know who our mother is. And so when Jesus says, you are of your father, the devil, we're kind of thinking, yeah, you give it to him, Jesus, right? You make sure, you make sure you let them know where they belong right now. But now I want you to turn over a few chapters, and I want you to go to John chapter 13. And you're going to see where I'm going with this here in a moment. We started with the Pharisees, but now we are in the upper room, and Jesus is spending time in the Lord's Supper uh, with his disciples, and John's account is really interesting. Um, in just a moment, we're going to go back to Luke chapter 22 and look at his account. But what's taking place here is that Jesus has uh, instituted the Lord's Supper. He's kind of described to them and taken it with them. Here's what this means. Here's what you are going to be doing to commemorating my death in the body and the blood uh, that I'm about to pour out on the cross. And right after that, if we're kind of piecing these together, um, I think one of the reasons that Jesus, um, that Jesus gets down on his knees to wash the disciples' feet is because of what happens in Luke chapter 22. You have to go to Luke chapter 22 to realize that the disciples start arguing among themselves. Who is the greatest? Which one of us gets to sit at the right hand of Jesus? Which one of us is the best disciple. And I think it's at that moment when Jesus gets up from the table, he takes off his outer cloak, he puts the towel around him, he begins to wash his disciples' feet. But when you get down to Luke chapter 22, he's gone through this entire thing in John 13 about here's what it means to be a servant. I who, who am your Lord and teacher, I'm even washing your feet. I'm showing you what it's like to serve so that it's not always about who is the greatest. And let this all stay in the back of your mind in a moment. But when you go to Luke chapter 22, verse 31, we have something that seemingly comes out of nowhere. Where Jesus, just ima imagine what it would be like to be sitting at that supper. You've had your feet washed. Um, Jesus then looks at Simon Peter and he says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned again, uh, then you will strengthen your brothers. And Peter said, but Lord, look, with you, I am ready to go to both prison and death. And Jesus said to him, I say to you, Peter, the rooster will not crow today until you have denied me three times that you know me. And he said to them, when I sent you out with money belt and bag and sandals, you did not lack anything, did you? They said, no, nothing. And then he goes on to talk about what it's going to look like now when they go out. In other words, what Jesus is doing is taking them from this pedestal that they have in their minds, maybe even in their hearts. Hey, not, let's notch it down a little bit. Let's not talk about who's the greatest. Let's not talk about who is uh, the smartest or who is the best. And maybe he decides to, to, to point out Peter here because Peter was always the one that would speak up first, right? Right? 
Who, who, does, who do people say that I am? Oh, people talk about you being Elijah and John the Baptist. Who do you say that I am? And Peter jumps up. Lord, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Lord, if it's you, you remember? Tell me to come to you out on the water, and I'll jump out of the boat. I mean, Peter was always the one who, who kind of thrust himself to the, to the forefront of the disciples. Maybe that's why Jesus looks at him specifically right here and says, hey, let's, let's back up for a minute. This idea of sifting as wheat, most of you in here understand that, but just in case somebody doesn't, it was the idea in the olden days of separating the wheat from the chaff, the grain from kind of the, the, the outer husk, the, the trash part of the wheat. And so what you would do is you would get it all in a pile and you had this you know, shovel type thing that you would throw it up into the air um, and the wind would blow through and the grain heads would fall back to the floor as the chaff, the, the trash part, would blow away. What Jesus is saying is Satan wants to know where you stand. Satan wants to know who you are, what you are. In other words, Peter, if you actually are one of my disciples and if you actually are a faithful disciple and one that is bearing fruit, then you're going to have to prove it. And I think that's one of the things that we need to be aware of tonight as we've begun, that Satan will begin to put pressure on us and attempt to grind and crush us because we are bearing fruit in his kingdom. He will toss us into the air to see which of these we are, the wheat or the chaff. Are we the steadfast tr uh, fruit or are we the trash that blows away in the wind? Do we leave Jesus in a fleeting moment? Do we, are we tossed to and fro the way James talks about it? And we're not really ever steadfast. We're not actually grounded in Christ. We profess him, but then we leave him. And then we come back, but then we leave again. Or when it gets really difficult, we just walk away altogether. So now I want you to Let's put these two groups of people together. You've got the disciples and specifically Peter, where Jesus has said you will be sifted as wheat. But we started with the Pharisees. We started with the people who are the religious leaders of the day, right? And it's easy for us to look in that moment and see how they're treating Jesus. They've been treating Jesus this way all along, but under the old law, they are still God's chosen. Both groups of people that we've just looked like are considered God's people. What does that say? To me, that says that God's people are in danger of Satan's work. If we're not careful, God's people, any and every single one of us, can be in danger of the way Satan works and giving into his wiles, if you will, his tricks, his schemes. So let's talk about that for a little bit. How does Satan work? How does Satan work on God's people? You're, you're, you're on fire for Christ. You're working. You're living. You are behaving and you are acting the way that a Christian should. You're living in the spirit and you are filled up and on fire for Christ. Well, here's probably not what's going to happen. Satan's not going to just pop up one day and in his extreme look at you and say, hey, just want you to remember that everything you believe about Jesus is stupid and, real, and irrelevant to life in the real world. That's not what Satan's going to do. Can you imagine how much easier temptation would be if we actually saw Satan pop up out of the ground every once in a while? Have you ever wondered, just wondered why couldn't it be that simple? You know, God says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Okay, just let me see the devil so I can kick him in the face every once in a while, right? It'd be a whole lot easier. But that's not the way he works. Satan doesn't always have to work in the extremes. And as a matter of fact, he's actually more effective in the subtleties. Satan doesn't need us to rebel and, certainly, and suddenly turn away from God. He just needs us to be content with being an average Christian. Satan doesn't need us to change our minds. He just needs our minds to wander and wander aimlessly. Satan doesn't need us to quit our faith altogether. He just needs us to grow weary of doing good. 
Satan doesn't need us to disbelieve. He just needs us to be a hypocrite. Satan doesn't need us to worship him. He just needs us to find a different idol. Satan doesn't need us to do wrong. He just needs us to overlook opportunities that God has given us to do what's right. Satan doesn't need us to stop focusing on Jesus. He just needs us to start focusing more on ourselves. Satan doesn't need us to physically follow through with our lusts. He just needs us to internalize them in our minds and our hearts so that we think of nothing else. Satan doesn't need us to stop going to church. He just needs us to turn church into a checklist, something that we do two or three times a week. Satan doesn't need us to get rid of our Christian friends. He just needs us to make excuses that keep us from being surrounded by them. Satan doesn't need us to hate our parents or authority in this world. He just needs us to be disrespectful towards mankind. And Satan doesn't need us to cross into the line of sin or cross the line into sin. He just needs us to get as close to the line as possible and flirt with sin so that at some point we can't even really tell what the difference is. Did any one of those subtleties prick you in the heart? Man, they do me. Those moments when when I've thought to myself, man, I've got it all together, and then the next thing you know, I realize I messed up. I got tricked by Satan. I thought I was okay, but here I am looking backwards and realizing, man, If only I'd known he was there. If only I'd known he was there. If you will, let's turn over to 1 Peter chapter 5 for a little while. We're going to spend some time jumping around uh, in our Bibles, uh, back and forth from James and 1 Peter, um, to talk about the ways in which Satan really works. But I've given you some examples of the subtleties in which Satan works, but then you've got this, uh, this passage that really brings out some of the subtleties in, a, in kind of a strange way. This is the passage that calls Satan a, you remember, a prowling or a roaring lion. Okay, and you're thinking to yourself, well, that's not very subtle. But if you think about the way a lion hunts, it actually kind of is. So we're going to begin in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. Cast all of your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert, because your adversary, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But resist him. Stand firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. So the question is, how does Satan use his subtleties to weaken his prey, to weaken us? Here's the first thing. He isolates us. Satan isolates us. you got to read into this a little bit, but there's a reason why throughout the pages of Scripture God talks about unity. There's a reason that in the Proverbs it talks about three strands are not quickly broken and, and the three together are stronger than just the one by itself. How does a lion hunt its prey, right? If you've ever watched any of those National Geographic Uh, Some of them get pretty gruesome, but every single time that a lion or a lion pride has gone out to hunt its prey, the one they're looking for is the weakest, the sickest, and the slowest, right? Y'all heard that funny story about every morning in the Sahara? Have y'all heard this one? Every morning in the the Sahara, uh, 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 a gazelle wakes up, and every morning in the Sahara, a lion wakes up, and the gazelle knows that it has to be faster than the uh, then the, then the uh, oh, how did it go? I just missed it. Has to be faster uh, than the fastest lion or it will be killed. And every morning the lion knows it has to be faster than the slowest gazelle or it will go hungry. 
And so the punchline is, it doesn't matter if you're the gazelle or the lion. When you wake up in the morning, you better be running, right? Okay? But it's a reality. The lion goes after the slowest, the sickest, and the weakest that it sees in the field. We got to be careful. If we start realizing that Satan is isolating us or we start allowing ourselves to be, to be carried away from the body of believers, then we need to be warned. We need to realize that we're in trouble. We absolutely need to, be, need to realize uh, that we are in trouble. The minute we start thinking we can do without the church, we've stepped into a dangerous and deserted place. Hebrews 10, 28. Anybody know what that passage is? Traditionally, it's a passage that um, we've used, I think, uh, in, in a fair way, to a degree, to talk about the need for church attendance, if you will. But I don't think that it needs to be used for church attendance just for the sake of making sure your name is on the roll. I want you to go to Hebrews 10, 28 with me, and I want you to look at the point of this passage. Here's why the Hebrew writer talks so specifically about what it ought to be like for the body of believers joining together. So we're going to start in verse 26. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, therefore there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terif uh, terrifying um, expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Um, I'm not in the right place. Hold on a second. Where'd we go? I've written down the wrong one. Help me out. 25. There it is. That's it. I wrote 25. We'll get to 28. Sorry, I wrote 28. We'll get to 28. Start in verse 22. That's what I meant to do. Thank you. All right, here we go. Let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So in other words, the point is we're trying to get away from this life of sin. We've been cleansed. We've been sanctified or justified by the blood of Christ. And so now he says in verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for the one who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now we hit verse 26. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there, uh, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of fire which will consume the adversaries. If you look at verse 20, 25, and it talks about not forsaking the assembly, but why? Because you've been sanctified, you've been washed, you've been cleansed from these evil consciences, and therefore he wants us to hold fast our conscience. Therefore, he says, help each other. Stimulate each other to good works. Spend time together. That's the idea of not forsaking the assembly. This is not a slap on the wrist type of verse to get on to people who don't show up. This is an encouragement. You need to show up because of the strength that you gain from God's people. And then notice again where I started on accident, what he goes back to. Because if you're not doing these things for each other, if you're not stimulating and, and motivating, if you're not encouraging, if you're not surrounding one another with love and prayers and faithfulness and steadfastness and perseverance and all the things that come with the promise of the body of believers, then you revert back to the sinful nature that you knew before you knew Jesus, right? When we begin to isolate ourselves or we allow Satan to isolate ourselves is when we get into trouble. Well, what are some of the ways that he does that? How about when we are stuck in sin for a moment and Satan uses those little lies like, nobody's going to care about you. Nobody wants to know. Just keep it to yourself. Or how about when you really feel like there's nobody else dealing with this on the face of the earth and Satan says, nobody would ever understand you. 
There's no reason to talk to people. They don't care. Guys, I'm going to tell you something. If you, if you think the church doesn't care about what you're going through, either one of two things, you're listening to Satan or you're going to the wrong people. You go to the body of believers who love God and love his people and want to see all of us getting to heaven, and you're going to find a people who will pray for you and stimulate you to good works and faithfulness. Don't allow Satan, don't allow Satan uh, to isolate you the way a lion would isolate the weakest of the, the, the herd. Here's the second thing Satan does, and we're going to go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we're seeing a glimpse into the Old Testament. Uh, Paul is using the, the illustration of the Israelites and how God had brought them out of Egypt and brought them out of slavery. And, and there's a very real uh, parallel here, you know, the slavery of Egypt or the slavery of sin. There's a, there's a reason he brings this up. But when you get down to chapter 10, verse 12, um, we're skipping all the context here, but the context is the people of Israel kept going back, right? They knew of God. They knew of his goodness, his salvation, his deliverance, but they kept going back to the ways of the Egyptian gods, to the sin of the past. They kept grumbling and complaining. Oh, man, we would have been better off in Egypt. Man, we'd have had so much more to eat. Yeah, but you would have been in slavery. So think about it for a minute. Isn't that what Satan does sometimes? Where he makes us think that what we could get on our own is better than what God could give us? You ever thought about that? Oh, man, if you, just, if you just live in the world, you can have this, 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 and this. And it completely discounts what God wants for us. And the minute that we start giving in to those selfish desires is the minute we begin being puffed up. And so look at what Paul says. Therefore, verse 12, let the one who thinks he stands take heed or be careful that he does not fall. You remember the last part of the last discussion Jesus is having with his disciples about who is the greatest. Hey, be careful. Satan's asked to sift you as wheat. Verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, free from Flee from idolatry. Flee from idolatry. Idolatry puffs us up, I think. And that's why he says, be careful if you think you stand, that's when you're about to fall. When we start surrounding ourselves with what we think we need, with what we think we're supposed to have, when we start thinking back to what life could have been or what life should have been. Or maybe even we think to ourselves that God's laws are not good enough for us, right? Here's something to remember. Satan will always offer us what we want. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. Satan will always offer us what we want, but what we want is most often not what is best for us. And with it may come destruction. God always gives us what we need. It's kind of the age-old illustration of the parent and the child who keeps running into the street, right? Satan says, go ahead, keep running out into the street, have fun. That's where everything is wide open. And what happens if you play in the street for too long? You're going to get run over, okay? That's kind of a grotesque picture to think about a child running in the street and getting run over. But that's exactly what happens if we keep running into the street, listening to Satan's voice. Oh, it's safe out here. Go ahead. No problem. It's the parent that says, that is not good for you. Come back to the yard. This is your boundary. Don't go any further than this right here. It's the parent who loves the, it's the, parent who loves the child and says, you stay away from the danger. Who is our parent? Our perfect parent other than God the Father in heaven. Who knows what's best for us? who sets the perfect boundaries, who gives us the perfect waiting times, who gives us all the best laws and guidelines and rules for our lives, not so that we can be uh, bunched up into a little ball and feel like we're not living, but so that we can actually have the best life. Remember what Jesus said in John 10? John 10, 10, I have come that they might have life and have life what? You remember his description? Life abundant. 
Oh, man, I love that. You, you, you want the greatest things in life? Pair yourself with Jesus. Put yourself in the promises of God and see if that's not the best life. Let's go back to James chapter 4 for a moment to understand this a little bit more. James chapter 4, you probably read some of this last night, but I want us to read it again. Repetition never hurts. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source of your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and you do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. In other words, you put yourself above others and you fight about what you think you're supposed to have more than somebody else and or you, when you are talking to God, right, you're submitting yourself to God. I think he's implying here that you might even go to God for some of these things, but it's all with the wrong motives. You're going to God with more of a, a, a genie in a bottle mentality than, than to the creator of the world who knows what's best for you. And so look at what he says in verse 4. This is strong language. You adulteresses, you've paired yourself with something outside of God's covenant with you. By the way, God, the greatest, to me, the greatest illustration of God's covenant with his people is the marriage covenant, that picture that is, that is, that is woven throughout the pages of Scripture. It's all the way in the Old Testament and all the way through the New Testament. Ephesians 5 and 6, when he talks about Christ loving the church as a husband loves his wife and vice versa, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. That's why he uses strong language here. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? We don't even think about it that way sometimes. Give me what I want. We, we tend to, to separate that from our relationship with God. We would never look at God and say, I hate you and I want this. But what James is saying is that when you do chase after those things, you are Saying that, to God, it's a hostility. It's an act of hostility. It's anger and hatred towards God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? That God jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. To me, that's a fascinating passage. Your translation might have a capital S, spirit, or a lowercase s, spirit. To me, either one works. God created the soul that lives in us, and, and when we are buried in the waters of baptism for the forgiveness of our sins, what did, you remember what he said in Acts 2.38? You will also receive the what? Gift of the Holy Spirit. So I think that's a fascinating mention there, that it could be either or. Your soul or God's Spirit living in you. Either way, God desires you. Why would you then take what he has given you or created for you and pair it to the things of the world? But God gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Satan puffs us up. God warns us and says, be humble, be humble. Here's the third thing Satan does. Back in 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, verse 9, let me read that one again just to make sure we have uh, the imagery. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 9, he says, But resist him firm in your faith that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. We need to understand that Satan will not just puff us up, but he will absolutely attack us in temptation. He will absolutely attack us in temptation. If he, if, if, he gets, if, if he goes through all the subtleties and realizes that you're not going to bow down, then all of a sudden he will attack you. But here's what's also interesting about that. When you go backwards to James chapter 1, he's still not attacking us as, as though he's just jumping out of nowhere and, and hitting us in the face. Notice this when you go down to verse uh, 12. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is, when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. 
But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. And then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Do not be uh, deceived, my beloved brethren. So he talks about the suffering in 1 Peter chapter 5, but then he says, by the way, this is what it might look like. It actually might look like a little bit of what we've already talked about. The fact that you want certain things and Satan just, said, just starts, man, just rolling out the red carpet for you. What, is, what are my desires that don't line up with God, but for some reason I keep finding those so easy to just walk towards? What are my, do, my, do my desires align with God or do I keep allowing Satan to fuel those desires? And what's interesting is that all of these desires, he says, they come from within. This is what you want. I came up with some self words. Here we go. I want to throw these out there and just maybe put these away for later. But self-preservation. Remember, this is all about us. Do whatever it takes to uphold your image and influence. Self-satisfaction. Do whatever you want that makes you happy. Self-pity. It's all about you. You're the only one in the middle of it. And if you're not, that, if you're not happy, the world should change to your desires Self-determination, it's up to you to be successful and respected. Self-rationale, it's okay uh, to do what you want to do because it makes you happy. Self-reliance, you got this. You don't need anyone's help, not even God's. Self-exaltation, it's all about me. And all of these things live under the umbrella of selfishness, right? Every single one of these live under the umbrella of selfishness. The question is, what do we do? When Satan tempts us, what do we do? How do we stand firm? Two quick things, and then I want to mention a, a few things that I've, that, that really when I was thinking about it, the whole teenage aspect, what do you do with this for teenagers? Uh, it, all, it always ends up being kind of, kind of being boiled down to two or three things. But here's, here's the first thing we do uh, to stand firm in the face of temptation. Go back to 1 Corinthians 10, just for time's sake, we're not going to read it again. But remember God's heart for you. Remember God's heart for you. In verse 13, it says, God will give you a way of escape. There's nothing you can go through that God is not going to be there. Don't, don't, uh, don't misunderstand God's intentions for you as God's way of keeping you back or holding you down or keeping you from enjoying the good life. And also, when you have an opportunity to do for others, maybe, maybe, uh, God's intentions are that you simply work for others and you realize um, you, you realize that God's heart for you is also for others and it becomes that community again. Remember your heart for God. If you're taking notes, Romans 6, verses 12 through 14. For time's sake, we're not going to go there. But temptation is nothing more than a proposal from Satan for us to give our bodies to sin. And that's what's talking about in Romans chapter 6 is now we've given ourselves to God and we've got to decide, am I going to keep living to sin or am I going to be a slave to righteousness? If you gave yourself to God, remember that heart. Remember your vows to God. Remember those marriage vows to God. Um, and, and don't forget, don't, don't set God aside because you want to run after the cares of the world. Rely on the Spirit for the strength to practice self-control. In Galatians chapter 5, it's the famous fruit of the Spirit passage, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Well, when you back up in that context, he actually lists a bunch of other fleshly desires or fleshly works, fruits, if you will, that he says, you got to put these away. you got to put these away. Why is it that he then tags on self-control. Because if it's all about, if it's up to me, I, I'm, I'm struggling. I'm in, I'm in trouble, right? Um, if, if, if I'm the one that has to overcome Satan, then I'm in trouble. But one of the things he says in verse 24 is that we've got to get rid of our passions and desires. Put yourself away and attach yourself to God. In verse 25, he talks about walking daily by the Spirit. And this is important because it's not a casual stroll. It's a head down, foot forward. I know where I'm going and nobody's going to take me away from the Spirit. Making sure we don't compare ourselves to other people. I think sometimes self-control is, uh, is thwarted by the fact that we want to be like everybody else. 
Nobody else has self-control. Everybody else is enjoying this. I need to be a part of that as well. But the reality is you don't. You need to be a part of God. And then when you get to chapter 6, verse 2, all part of that same context, he talks about the fact that sometimes we're going to have to help each other out and bear each other's burdens. Now, that's a quick, just real quick run through of Galatians 5 and 6. Here's what I want to end, uh, end with. Jared asked me to talk about what is it that we need to know when we're thinking about t- uh, teenagers and the temptations? How do you help them resist the devil? I want to go back real quick. If Satan isolates us, then the last thing that our teenagers uh, need is to be away from the church. Parents, are you making sure your teenagers are in church? And, and I'm not talking about checking the box. And, but if that's all, it, if, if your teenager is anti-church right now, um, then the best thing you can do is still help them realize that being at church with God's people is still the best thing for them. Don't, don't let them chase after every other thing and fi- come up with all these other uh, excuses. Don't, don't help them with the excuses that keep them away from the church. I'm going to tell you, when I've seen teenagers walk away from God, it's because they got so involved in every other area of life. They still called themselves a Christian. They sh- still showed up from time to time. They still got the graduation Bible. They still even got baptized. But at the end of the day, Everything outside of the church was more important than what God was doing in the church and doing in them. Keep your kids in church. Bring them to church. Make sure they understand what church is when it comes to God's people and his love for the church. The second thing is he puffs us up. What does this have to do with teenagers? Y'all, I love a cell phone just like everybody else. I love sports just like everybody else. But I'm going to tell you what Satan's going to do because I've watched it happen for 21 years. Satan is going to use the thing as, things of this world to, to allow our teenagers to feel a success, to feel an importance that ends up being skin deep. Those social media apps are nothing more than skin deep achievement. It, it is a puffed up pride. And you will find, y'all, I, I don't even have time to get into all this, but you will find kids' lives falling apart when they think they ought to be upholding an image And for some reason, whatever that reason is, that image isn't being upheld. It's because Satan has given them an unreal expectation of self. um, And we've allowed them to just keep having it in their hands or allowed them to keep chasing it. I know what time it is. You asked me to do this. All right, last one. Here we go. All right. (laughs) Satan tempts us and and attacks us. Guys, children don't know how to stand up to the devil. That's what I've learned. Um, even this week, this past week at camp, I had some kids, we had some kids show up to camp, and I'm like, man, why are these kids even here? They didn't care about camp for what camp is about, church camp, you know. All they wanted was to chase girls or chase boys and be about the sports and this and that and steal other kids' snacks and all this kind of stuff. And, and then I was talking to one of the dads uh, today about a kid who came, and at the end of the week, I mean, this was one of the punk kids, okay, At the end of the week, he's crying because when he goes back home, he's right back in a pit of darkness at his home because his parents don't know God and don't care about him. And and that hit me. It struck me all over. I was sitting there saying, man, I wish this kid wouldn't come back because it makes it miserable on others. When what I needed to realize is this kid has no way to fight Satan. If your children are loved by you, and they are, If your children are blessed to have parents who care about them, and they are, then don't hesitate to build boundaries around them for as long as you can. I'm not saying saying you put them in a bubble, okay? That's not what I'm talking about. And I'm not saying get them out of whatever trouble that they get themselves into. I'm just saying make sure they understand boundaries. Make sure you reason with them. Have discussions with them. What is good for them? What's bad for them? Be real about the friends that they're hanging out with. Okay, and struggle through life with them because I'm going to tell you something. They can't struggle against Satan on their own. If it is a partnership where you are trying to help them understand what it is to become a faithful member of the Lord's body, they may not get it all right now, but at some point it'll click. I'm done. You want me to close in prayer? Okay.
He went so long, I won't take up any much more time either. Uh, no, he did great, man. I, I love this guy. I know he did a great lesson. Um, there are, I asked him to come talk about teens, and I, as far as looking at Bible-rama and deciding what, what's a success and, and failure, I will take quality over quantity any day. Um, we have put that at, at the foremost for the past couple of years. We get quality speakers for our teens. We get quality speakers to come in here and speak to you. Um, but I like when I can brag on uh, quantity at the same time. Last night we had 328 here, which was a great number to start us off. Anything over 300, uh, I would, my goal for the past five years is to go over 300 all four nights. You, we've hit 300 on Sunday before. We've dipped down under it Monday, Tuesday. We, sometimes we come back and, and we're over 300. Never have we been over 300 all four nights. 328 last night, 334 tonight, which is a great number. Um, but again, going back to the, qua the quality, I believe people come for the quality. Um, we have set that as a precedence for our kids and especially our teenagers in the quality of speakers that we get to come speak to them. John David was one of the ones that came and talked to them last year. And uh, so a lot of those have come back. Ten, we have church, other churches in our area that have brought kids. And so tonight upstairs in the teen room, there are 64 teenagers here tonight. Uh, there are more teens up there than there are adults in this room. Um, so that's wonderful, but that says a lot for our speakers and, and what we're doing, and so I, I appreciate all the help that we have that puts that together. There are refreshments and drinks outside. It is beautiful outside today. Uh, last night after all the rain, there was a double rainbow right over there. If you were looking towards the drag strip, that was pretty as it could be. I know it was gone before we dismissed last night, but it was beautiful. I think it's God saying, I'm not going to make it rain the rest of the week. So... Um, we will dismiss with a prayer. You'll dismiss outside. If you have a cradle roll child, I need you to go pick them up right now. The twos, threes, and four-year-olds should be out here on the blow-ups. When you get done eating, you can get them. The rest of the kids will come back in here at 7.50 in roughly 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll dismiss. I will let the third grade and up go, but I'll make the kids second grade and under stay in the pew for you to come get them if you have a child in there. Um, let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you so much for the safety that you gave us last night. We thank you so much for the sunshine today. Uh, Lord, it was dry, and, and we were praying for rain, and we thank, we're thankful that you sent it to us. Uh, in the midst of the rain and the wind last night, we're thankful for the men that, that kept us safe and, and watched out for us. We know that you were looking out for us. We thank you for all the safe travels that you've given us here today. Lord, I thank you so much for all of the workers and the teachers that are present tonight, especially our, our two speakers that drove here for the time and the effort that they put into uh, studying and, and preparing and for teaching everyone that's here tonight. Father, I'm thankful for those that are watching our kids and, and being mentors to them and keeping them safe. And I'm thankful for all those that have made and brought food and those that have prepared it for us and, and looked out and, and planned this week so that we enjoy your word, but we enjoy the fellowship with other Christians also. Father, we thank you for the family that we have, our Christian family, and thankful for the church and the leaders here that have sought forth to put this together so that we have a place in this avenue to come fellowship together. Uh, we love you, and we thank you for sending your sons. In his name we pray. Amen.
trees and the forest filled with trees and the mountains up so high at the top he placed the sky fingerprints are everywhere just to show how much he cares but in the middle he had lots of fun he made a hippo that weighed a ton hip 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 hippopotamus hip hip hooray god made all us hip 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 hippopotamus hip hip hooray god made all us can you go faster? Yeah! Ready? Yeah. In the beginning, God made the seas and the forest filled with trees and the mountains up so high. And at the top, he placed the sky. Fingerprints are everywhere just to show how much he cared. In the middle, he had lots of fun. Made a hippo that weighed a ton. Hip, 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 hippopotamus. Hip, hip, ray, God made all us. Hip, 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 hippopotamus. Hip, hip, ray, God made all us. You can't go any faster. Faster? In the beginning, God made the seas and the forest filled with trees and the mountains up so high. And at the top, he placed the sky. Fingerprints are everywhere. Just to show how much he cares. In the middle, he had lots of fun. Made a hippo that weighed a ton. Hip, 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 hippopotamus. Hip, hip, break. God made all of Stand up. I'm going to count to three. I need everybody to crow like a rooster. One, two, three. I'm going to count to three. Yeah, roosters don't do that. I'm going to count to three. I need everybody to say booster. One. One, two, three. Very good. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to sing the booster song, and when I say don't be grouchy like a rooster, I need you to crow. And when, I say, when we say booster at the end, I need you to say it loud. So everybody sit down. Booster, booster, be a booster. Don't be grouchy like a rooster. Booster, booster, be a booster. And boost our Bible school. It's pretty good. Let's do that again. Booster, booster, be a booster. Don't be grouchy like a we learn and pay attention we've talked about submitting to God tonight we talked about resisting the devil let's see how much we are good at following the leader who's our leader yeah. I know I'm tonight but who's our leader in heaven God's our leader we got to follow God and do what God says this is a good training song for following the leader Eyes up here, just like we put our eyes on God. There was a lot of kids standing up, but I don't know why. Sit down. There was a rich old king. Where are you going? There was a rich old king. He had a thousand men. He marched them up the hill. And then he marched them down again. Now when you're up, you're up. And when you're down, you're down. But when you're only halfway up, you're neither up or down. All right, let's play this fun game. 
Follow the leader, you're in the game. You don't follow the leader, you gotta sit down. Where are we going? There was a ritual king. Knock, sit down. There was a ritual king. He had a thing. Michelle, you're out. There was a ritual king. He had a thousand men. He marched them up the hill and then he marched them down again. Out. Now, when you're up, you're up. And when you're down, you're down. But when you're only halfway up, you're neither up. Edie Johnston, out. Sit down. Or down. There was a ritual king. He had a thousand men. He will. Out. Sit down. He marched them up the hill and then he marched them down again. Now when you're up, you're up. And when you're down, you're down. But when you're only halfway up, out. Sit. You're neither up or down. There was a ritual king. He had a thousand men. He marched them up the hill and then out. He marched them down again. Now when you're up, you're up. And when out. When you're down, you're down. But when you're only halfway up, you're neither up or down. You can sit down. Sometimes, sit down, sit down, Nola. Sometimes, hey, listen. Who do we and your mamas and daddies want you to always, always, always listen to? God. We always want you to listen to God. How do we listen to God? What? Sometimes other people will tell you to do something other than what God wants you to do. Sometimes the people sitting next to you will tell you not to follow along in this song or to sing when we're told not to sing or to say something that we're not supposed to say. Sometimes people will try to trick you into doing something that you shouldn't do, but it looks fun and it looks like we'll get attention for it, but that's not what God wants us to do, is it? See, like, like Sailor. Sailor's talking when she's not supposed to be talking. And it's not funny, is it? No. So, we're going to sing our prayer song and we're going to ask God to be with us so that we can come back tomorrow night. Who's coming back tomorrow night? Who had fun tonight? God is listening, God is listening when we pray, when we pray. Bow our heads just slightly, close our eyes so tightly. Now let's pray, now let's pray. God is listening, God is listening when we pray, when we pray. Bow our heads just slightly, close our eyes so tightly. Now let's pray. Now let's pray. God, you have been so good to us. Thank you so much for letting us come to Bible Rama. Thank you so much for letting us have so much fun tonight while we've learned about you. Father, we've learned tonight how to resist the devil. Help us to continue to do that each and every day and tell him no. Help us to be good boys and girls to our mamas and our daddies and our grandparents that take care of us. Help us to be polite to others so that they can see what kindness looks like and so that hopefully we will be able to give you the credit and tell them that it's because we go to church and it's because we know God that we act the way that we do. Help us to shine our light always to those that are around us and help us to come back tomorrow night to learn more about you and learn more about your word. 
Thank you for everyone that helped make this night so great and take us home safely to our homes. And as we say our prayers tonight, help us to remember those that we love and those that we know that are sick, and we hope that you help them get better. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and amen. If you are in, if you're a five-year-old or a kindergartner, stay on, Hux. If you are a first grader or a second grader, I need you to stay right where you are and your parents will come get you. I need you to sit down, sweetie. If you are a third grader or a fourth grader, you can stand up and you can go that way. If you are a fifth grader or a sixth grader, you can stand up. Hux, where are you going? Sit down. Then just sit down until everybody else goes. <laughs> 